All right. Yep, quiz three. So some of these ideas will be on exam three. So exam three is going to be what for sure respiratory and lymphatic. So some of these same questions might come up again. Um, so yeah, explain the functions of the lymphatic system. So that was just to um, transport lipids and, you know, lipid soluble vitamins, anything that's not water soluble. And number two, it's got a role in the immune system. And number three, it drains the excess interstitial fluid. So that was that question. And then describe at least five components of the first line of defense. So um, describe, not, not just list. Um, but, you know, it is like, um, I don't know. Hold on. You know, like describe. Hold on. Let me think about that. I mean, I could describe the skin a little bit, but, you know, how do I do, what am I supposed to say about, like, emesis, like throwing up, vomiting? I mean, it's, you puke. I mean, what else am I supposed to say? So, I don't know. But, you know, it's all of those. So, it was like, you know, skin and um, tears and, and diarrhea and the pH of your um, gastric tract and the pH of your urinary tract and, um the mucous membranes and um i'm i'm hoping you would have um i'm hoping you would have said something about it instead of just listing words i have a very strong feeling that most of you just listed words because um i get it because you're just interested in i just need to put down an answer and get my points and get my grade and you're just trying to think you're just trying to get through the next few weeks and i get it Although I'm going to work against you at every turn, but I get it. All right. So I guess, you know, if you wrote down just words, that's probably fine for that question. For number three, definitely not words. So um, you've got the cells. What about the cells? What are the two different types of cells? What do they do? You know, so the NK cells versus the um, phagocytic cells, the phagocytes, macrophages, you know, how do they work? Um, and you've got fever. What about fever? Your, um, you know, your temperature goes up. Why? Um, and then uh, inflammation. I wanted you to talk about increased permeability and um, and vasodilation. You know, and maybe some of the um, chemicals involved in that. If it were me, I would have probably not done the inflammation one because that one might be the hardest or or i might have cut out either that one i would have cut that one out or i would have cut out the antimicrobial proteins i would have definitely gone with fever because that's really easy and then the cells are kind of easy i would have gone with those um so cells fever antimicrobial proteins and um inflammation so i wanted you to talk talk a little bit elaborate not just those four words that's not enough i'm asking you to describe not list no that was question three question four describe again they're always going to be like almost always going to be like that um the four functions of antibodies so you're going to talk about um agglutination path you know um, clustering of of um pathogens uh, it enhances phagocytosis because the stems of um, antibodies act like like flags. They um, they block toxins, and um, they can block toxins and prevent viral attachment. And um, I'm probably missing something else that I can't think of. So what do we have? Clustering, um, enhancing phagocytosis, blocking um whatever i don't know i don't feel like thinking anyone have am, am i missing something anybody what's that 
Inhibiting the bacteria? Oh yeah, inhibiting bacterial toxins. So they block bacterial toxins, prevent viral attachment, yeah. They, um, they all, oh, and they also, um, mobility. I knew some of you were gonna chime in with that. Cut off the legs. <laughs> yeah. Cilia and flagella, particularly cilia, not so much flagella. Flagella is not a really common way for human pathogens to get around. It's more cilia. I mean, that's really, uh, okay, so that's antibodies. Describe how cell-mediated immunity works. And I'm telling you in the second part of this question to make sure you talk about how Ant antigen presenting cells are presenting pieces of antigen to the um, T8 cells. And then you're going to have a co-stimulation of interleukin-2 from the helper T cells or T4 cells. And then um, those are going to clone into cytotoxic T cells, or if you want to call them killer T cells, um, you know, they have different names and those they're going to use granzymes and perforin, just like natural killer cells, they can use granzymes and, and, and perforin. So that's the cell-mediated immunity. I didn't ask you about antibody-mediated immunity. Um, oh, one more. Oh, this one's really super easy. List four infectious pathogens. Hope you got um, virus, bacteria, uh, fungi, that's easy, and then uh, protozoa. And you probably said parasites or worms or something like that. Um, so I just wanted you to list four of them. And yeah, that's the quiz. I haven't graded any of them yet, but um, y'all just finished it. So, and this week, we should one, do that. That's one question on the innate versus the um, acquired. Is that general versus specific? Yeah. Okay, that's, um, you know. Generals, generals innate. The book is kind of, it's kind of all over, you know, so it was kind of hard to get it like just as a right here, you know? Yeah, some some books and people refer to it as um, innate versus acquired immunity. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I was on the right track. Okay, all right. I don't like that because there's some acquired or, or there's some things that we would consider um, specific immunity that you're, that you, in, that you get, I guess you get it after you're born, but there's things you get in breast milk, like you get antibodies and, um, you know, there's some things that you get right off the bat, um, that are sort of, you know, inherited. I don't know. But anyway. Right. I, there's a lot of, like, like you're saying, those kind of things, you know, like with the mom and the baby, you know, so that, that, you know, in the classroom and all of that stuff. So yeah. I was kind of like, mm. right, right. And that's so I can see I'm thinking, yeah. It's hard to get it specific, you know, <laughs> give it a category. So today is uh, respiratory. Um, I don't, I can't see myself getting through it, but you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not going to rush it. I'm not going to rush it. I mean, this is all important the last four chapters, I'm not going to get to all four of these chapters. There's no way I can do it. I, I usually don't when I'm in a class. I, I think it's too much information. I mean, really what I should do is I should back off on the digestive. I tend to go heavy on digestive system, and I don't know why. I think urinary and electrolytes are more important than digestive, but um, anyway, that's for me. Um, let me start with respiratory. We'll see how, how far we get. Um, so I am on track and by the way, this semester, I keep making the same mistake. Um, I'm calling it the word dilation. I'm calling it, di I keep writing dilation, like D-I-A-L-A-T-I-O-N, which is a, uh, not correct. I can't stop doing it for some reason. It's just something that I've, I, I know I say it wrong and write it wrong. I've known that for decades. Just, I, I don't know. So anyway, something, I saw something that made me think of that. So here's the, um, 
<clears throat> respiratory system. Um, the upper respiratory is, you know, up your, your, your larynx, like, like your <clears throat> above your, uh, so low, lower respiratory would be like down in your trachea and, and down in your lungs. I mean, really, we kind of mean your, your, your like down, down in this area is kind of lower. When somebody says lower, I'm thinking down here. When somebody says upper, I'm thinking up here, like the tonsils, nose, stuff like that. But this is the respiratory system. It's, you know, it's your, your larynx, your voice box, your trachea, and your lungs. We're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, but that's it. A few things, I guess, while we're looking at this, if you notice here, the lungs are lobed. So you don't have just two lungs. You have three lobes on the right side, and you have two lobes on the left side. And you see that little notch right there? Let me let this person in. That notch is called the, um, the cardiac notch. It's kind of where the apex of your heart is. Um, and yeah, I tend to blow through the anatomy of these things, partly because we have lab I'm hoping that you, I guess just to remind you, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but to remind you, you should be, um, one of the reasons you should be catching up with lab or like caught up with lab is that we're doing, like right now, you should be starting respiratory system with your lab. So if you're on um, cardiac, cardiology or something, like we're done with that. So, you know, that would have benefited you back then. It's not really benefiting you as much now, right? So doing the respiratory labs would benefit you. And that's why I kind of blow through the anatomy like that. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I am going to try to make it bigger. All right. Here's your nose. We call your nostrils nares, N-A-R-E-S, instead of saying nostril. Um, and look at all that. Um, the pharynx, all right, I'm going to come back to that, but this is your pharynx, is your, you know, your uh, throat, your mouth area, this, so here's your, uh, here's your nares, your nasal cavity, um, concave mean, you know, like a conch is a, uh, like a shell, right, and so there's like three rounded areas inside your nose. So they call them conche or sometimes turbinates. And um, that's, that's what they're showing there. But here, if you see like over here where my uh, pointer is, there's three areas here, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. So the nasopharynx is right here. So there's your eustachian tube that leads to your ear. Um, in kids, um, in, in, in us, the eustachian tube it's like i'm going it's it's up i'm thinking about this it's uphill going from the nose to the ear right so the mucus has to go uphill in the eustachian tube when you're a kid it kind of is more flat so it's easier for the stuff like that sinus infection to end up in your eardrum so but anyway there's the eustachian tube which is the opening of the you know, the opening of the eustachian tube, the whatever they're calling auditory tube, what do you call it, ear canal. Um, this is the uvula right here, that dangly thing in the back of your throat that um, that has to do with the digestive system, really, that closes. So this thing is going to close up and block your nasal passage. So that's the uvula. Um, there's tonsils on both sides of that uvula, the palatine tonsils. Those are the ones that sometimes get um, get inflamed. And then um, there's also lingual tonsils down here. And um, there's another pair that I'm not looking for really. We're up here, pharyngeal tonsil. Okay, so the nasopharynx, we have the pharyngeal tonsil and we have the um, eustachian tube. So that's in the nasopharynx. So all of this is the pharynx, this opening area. 
where like your mouth and your nose meet. So um, this is naso. This is oropharynx, and this is the these are the fosses right here, which is just the opening. That's it. It's the it's nothing really. It's nothing I'm going to test you on for sure. And then um, the laryngopharynx is down here where the larynx is. So here's the larynx. Here's your Adam's apple. Here's your epiglottis. Again, that's a digestive system feature that's going to block your trachea. So here's your esophagus here, like the arrows going down the esophagus. And now the arrow is going down the trachea. So the trachea is in front here. That's what we're talking about today. The esophagus is um, right behind it or uh, posterior to it. There's your larynx. Uh, the very top is the hyoid bone. Here's a frontal view of it or an interior view. There's the epiglottis right there. So that's a cartilage associated with the um, with the larynx. Then you have the um, thyroid thyroid cartilage. That's the Adam's apple. And then if you feel right below it, where you feel the first indention go down, so you feel your Adam's apple and then go down a little bit. That's going to be the um, cricothyroid ligament. That um. Not so much in the ER, but out like on an ambulance, that's where they would try to do a trach. Because if you look at the cricothyroid ligament, that's a lot bigger area. So let's go down to the next one. See, that's not a lot of space, right? So all the spaces, once you get down to the trachea, the spaces between the rings, it's not a lot of space. They'll put a stoma in there. But they'll they'll do a trach up here a little bit further. It's just a little bit easier to get to. All right, so thyroid ligament, cricoid ligament. Here's your thyroid gland, which has nothing to do with the larynx. Just I'm just giving you like a location. Um, so then let's look um, like down the the trachea. Um, there's a side view. Oh, let me tell you one thing. The um, so these cartilages up here in the in, like the cricoid cartilage. It goes all the way around the back. So if we look at the back side right here, this is going all the way around the back. But if you look at the trachea, and the trachea is right here, this all these rings, they're not going all the way around. So all that cartilage that's in your trachea, like the bumps in your trachea, the rings, they're um they're like shaped like a C because the esophagus is like right behind it. Esophagus sometimes needs room to to open up a little bit. There's your parathyroid glands, by the way, but it's a separate thing. Uh, side view, I don't know why I got that. All right, this is looking down the the, the trachea. And so a couple things here. One, um, this these white things right here, those are your uh, vocal cords, or um, we call them vocal folds, right? Or vocal cords, whatever you want to call it. And then right next to it, the red area next to it are called the false vocal cords or ventricular folds. So the white here, that's your vocal cords. Next to it, ventricular folds. So the ventricular folds, if you want to like take a breath and hold it in, or if you're like anticipating that somebody's going to like punch you in the stomach or something, you take that breath and like hold it in that the ventricular folds are what allow you to do that. And then as you know, the vocal folds are what is producing sound. So as we bring those together, the sound, the pitch goes up. And as you bring them apart, the pitch goes down. And so we've got two, mainly two muscles that control that. And if you look over on the left, you can see them. The posterior cricoarytenoids, posterior and lateral cricoarytenoids. So these two muscles are controlling whether these vocal folds are going to like come together or go apart. To be honest, I'm not probably not going to ask you a question about that. Um, that's just showing you a slide. Again, it's kind of showing you where the esophagus is in relation to the to the trachea. And, you know, this is the cartilage ring of the trachea. It doesn't go all the way around. 
and then here's the esophagus. When you look at an esophagus in the cadaver, it's um it's rather flat. It just it stays flat until food goes in it. Okay, so your trachea, about 12 centimeters long and about two and a half centimeters in diameter. Two and a half centimeters is about an inch, roughly, two point, yeah, something around there. Um, just to give you kind of an idea. So um, there's four layers when you look at the histology of the trachea. So the innermost layer, or like the part that the air is touching, is called the mucosa. Right, so the mucosa is, by the way, mucosa is used in lots of organs. Like in the stomach, we also refer to the mucosa or the mucosa of, um, or like the inside of your cheek, right? Same thing in your um, trachea. So the mucosa is like the inner layer. This is the only place in the body that I can think of that has pseudostratified columnar tissue. That's not so important to me personally, but the ciliated part is important because the cilia uh, push up dust or, or mucus or whatever. It, it's like little hairs and they push it up far enough so that you can cough it out <clears throat> or clear your throat, which you do all day. You just don't realize it. <clears throat> now you might feel like you have to because I suggested it to you. And your mute's on, so there's no embarrassment there. Um, so it's ciliated, the mucosa is ciliated. Um, the submucosa is the next layer underneath. Oh, by the way, people with certain types of COPD, like emphysema, those cilia stop working. And um, they can't really assist in pushing mucus up. So that mucus is going to keep dropping down into your lungs. That's that's one of the problems. Submucosa is the next layer underneath it. I put connective tissues. That means um, that's what we do when we don't want to really describe a tissue and we don't care about it. We just say connective tissue. It's kind of a catch-all. Um, and there's mucus glands in there that are making the mucus because it's got air. Think about it. Air is going down and up this trachea all the time. It can't be dry though. It's all going to get all brittle and crack up, right? So we got to keep it moist. Um, so that, hence mucus glands. Then the, the cartilage, right? 16 to 20 rings, depending on how tall you are. I'm probably more at the 16 ring. And then adventitious, the outer um, layer of, um, of the uh, trachea. So if you were to grab a trachea out of a cadaver, you're going to be like holding on to, you're going to be touching the uh, adventitia. Um, adventitia, by the way, because there's two words you can use. One's called serosa and one's called adventitia. The fact that it's called adventitia tells me that something's attached to it. Professor? Yeah. Can you spell that word? So, so. Adventitia? Serosa? S E R. O S A. So some of your esophagus is called serosa. Some of your esophagus is called adventitia. Depends on if something else is joining to it. So the the trachea and the esophagus are joined together. So if I were to take it out of a cadaver, they would come together, and then I would just kind of pinch the two, and I could just kind of tear it apart. And it easily comes apart, but they're they're attached to each other. Of course. Your uh, your when I keep doing, your trachea stops right there at your lungs, you know, right around the heart level. Your esophagus obviously keeps going, right? So at the point where they disconnect from each other, where the esophagus keeps going down, then I call it serosa. So that's like a little, I don't know, I don't know what it is. Here we go. Here's a um, another photo of it all, and. So the air goes into your mouth or into your nose, into the pharynx. So I'm not going to say, like, that's much better than saying mouth or nose. It goes into your pharynx. Then your larynx. It passes your larynx. Then it goes into the trachea. So now I'm over here on this right side. So it's going to go into your trachea. 
Then down here where it splits, we call it the carina. It's like a, you can't really see it here, but it's like a triangular shaped piece of cartilage. And then it goes left and right. So it goes to the right lung and goes to the left lung. So we call that a uh, primary bronchi or, or I guess a singular uh, for that would be called bronchus, right? So you've got like the left bronchus doing it again. This is my left side, left bronchus and right bronchus. I don't know what that does, but anyway, left bronchus and right. So you got your two primary bronchi. Then if you notice, this picture's not doing a good job showing this, but again, your lungs are lobed. So there's three lobes on one side and there's two lobes on the other side. So they're gonna split again where you have the secondary bronchi. They're gonna split to go to each lobe. They're not showing you at all here. They're, so like right here, here it is, like here's the primary. And then if you follow my arrow, it's split. Here's one here, and then it's going down here. That's a, that's a secondary right here. There's another secondary. It's supposed to split again, but it's not. It's not showing it to you, <clears throat> right? So there would be three secondary bronchi on this side, and then it would split twice here, and there'd be two secondary bronchi. Um, then it's gonna once it's in the lobe, it's gonna split again into tertiary bronchi. So now we're out here at these smaller, these smaller ones, all these smaller ones. And then if you look out again, they're gonna split. They're gonna become even smaller and more numerous. So now I'm like looking at these little tiny ones out here, and those are the bronchioles. So um, that's kind of where people will have um, like bronchitis or um, if you have some kind of inflammation, it'll affect you at the bronchioles because they're smaller. So that it'll affect you more um, there. Not to say that this other stuff can't also get constricted. It can, but you're going to feel it more once you get into the bronchioles. And then there's terminal bronchioles. So I'm going to show you the next slide. There's terminal bronchioles. And then there's finally something else. The end of it all is called the alveolus, which I'm going to show you. Look at the diaphragm, by the way. It's right underneath the lungs. So that's important. And the lungs, it's, it's, it's sort of attached. So it's not, it, it, it's, it's like here, it doesn't look like it's attached, but this diaphragm is attached at the bottom to these lungs, or there's like some membrane in there. It's like, there's like a suction, right? So if I were to come, if I were to grab underneath that diaphragm and like pull it down, the lungs would get like pulled down with it. It'd create like a suction and it would, it would make the lungs like bigger. So anyway, um, got no idea why I kept that slide. Why did I keep the slide? Did I want to show you something? Whatever, it's over now. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. Gravity maybe? Yeah, exactly. Parietal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's so. I wanted to show you that that black space right here, just like the heart had a the pericardium around it here it's the same thing so you have like a the lungs and then you have some a space with some fluid and then there's like so there's a, like a visceral layer and a parietal layer and um there's like fluid in between so there is like a little bit of a fluid buffer there's three places where we have these things we call it um it's not like peritoneum but there's different places where we have these membranes one's in the heart where you have the pericardium. One's in the lungs. So you have a uh, um, pleura, P-L-E-U-R-A. So they'll call it like a pleural, well, right here, the next word underneath, pleural cavity. And then there's one down in your, um, in your abdomen, they call it peritoneum. That's a different chapter, but you know, there's three places. So you'll hear these words, um, pericarditis, um, pleuritis, which is like the inflammation of this area right here. And then, um, 
peritonitis. Probably the peritonitis will be the one you will see, well, it depends, right? But I think it's the one you might run into the most. All painful. All right, anyway, I think that's why I had that slide up there. Um, nothing here. Okay, so back to, to the bronchioles, right? Primary bronchial, secondary, tertiary, I mean, sorry, primary bronchus, bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, then bronchioles, then terminal bronchioles, then alveolar sacs or alveoli. So if we were using like a street analogy, then it would end on a cul-de-sac, right? So, or, or you could just imagine like a bunch of grapes. That's what it's like. And this, the grapes, they all have nets, like a network of um, blood capillaries surrounding them. So, um, yeah. Trying to think of some other analogy. Um, this is just, uh, you could skip this for now. So this over here, right? So the air, when it comes in, it's going down your trachea, then it's splitting into primary bronchus, secondary, tertiary, uh, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, then finally the alveolus. And at the alveolus or alveoli, um, and this whole thing is like an alveolar sac, sac. Um, this is where you have gas exchange. So you see right here how there's like all this blood, some of it's red, some of it's blue to tell you that some of it's oxygenated, some of it's deoxygenated. <coughs> that's, um, that's where gas exchange happens. <coughs> so yeah, that's where gas exchange occurs. It's pretty much, let me see if I got a slide on it. No, I don't. It's pretty much um, one So in the alveolus, you have one layer of flat epithelial tissue that's attached to a basement membrane. Then you have the blood vessel itself, the blood capillary. It's a flat layer of squamous epithelium attached to a basement membrane. So you have, you have uh, the epithelial tissue and the basement membrane of the blood vessel, and it's fused to the epithelial tissue and the basement membrane of the alveolus. So that's what the oxygen or carbon dioxide has to break through. It has to squeeze through one flat layer of epithelial cells and the basement membrane. Then it's got to go through one more basement membrane and another flat layer, single, single simple flat layer simple squamous layer of epithelial cells so that's it so it just diffuses pretty much the oxygen just goes from a higher concentration to lower concentration so when you breathe in all the oxygen is in the alveolus the pressure of oxygen is higher in the alveolus than it is in this blood around it so the pressure when you breathe in is higher of oxygen is higher in the capillary in the, in the uh, alveolus than it is in the blood capillaries so you so the oxygen just simply diffuses it squeezes between those cells and it goes into the blood and carbon dioxide is doing the opposite it's moving the opposite direction so at the time where you're breathing in the pressure of carbon dioxide is much higher in the blood than it is in this alveolus. So while oxygen is moving into the blood, carbon dioxide is moving into the alveolus. And then when you breathe out, that oxygen goes out. It's all diffusion. So in the alveolus, there's, I guess, two types of cells. Um, uh, the real one I wanted to get at was the septal cells, right? Type 1 is just the cells, the cells that line the alveolar wall. Type 2, septal cells, yeah, here we go. Septal cells, or type 2 alveolar cells, they make surfactant. So the lungs 
have to stay moist, can't be dry, can't have dry stuff inside of our body. It'll get all brittle and die and you know, you got to keep it moist. But then there's a problem because water has a surface tension, like water creates a barrier. You're trying to get oxygen past that water. So you have the lining of the alveolus and it's, 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 it's liquid, it's water. And how are you going to move the oxygen past that water? And so these type two alveolar cells, uh, septal cells, they're making this stuff called surfactant, which lowers the surface tension. And so that is, um, that's another problem with people with COD, COPD, like they're not making surfactant. And so the lungs, um, it, uh, it, it's kind of like a rubber band. Well, you know what? I'll get to it in when I, when I start going over physiology, but that's another problem. Like the, if, 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 um, if the type two alveolar cells are getting killed off by a disease, by like fibrosis or some autoimmune disease, then you're not making surfactant. And now the liquid is, um, it's, 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 uh, the surface tension is, is high and the, and the oxygen can't go through. So you're breathing in oxygen, but it's not moving into your blood. So then you're breathing out oxygen. When I see you breathe, when I see someone breathe out, I want to see, like you can monitor it, right? I want to see a good level of carbon dioxide. I don't want to see like low levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen that, are, that is higher than, than it should be. Um, all right. And then this is the respiratory membrane I was telling you about, how it's like, um, yeah, right here. So here's the, you know, there's a sim simple right here, simple squamous attached to a basement membrane. And then when you look at the capillary, simple squamous attached to a basement membrane. So we call that a respiratory membrane right here. It's not a big deal. I'm making a bigger deal out of it than it needs to be. All right. Question so far. Because that was all anatomy. Even though I was turning it into physiology, but it's, it was anatomy. Now I'm kind of going to get it. You know, that was just like where things are. And now I want to get into how things work. I was going to say the uh, the type two cells. I thought that was interesting because, you know, the, but the babies, when they uh, are premature, you know, they'll always give steroids to mature the lungs. And because of that surfactant. And it's I'm so glad you said that. That's exactly, that's exactly the issue with premature babies. Right. The, the white male is the wimpiest. Then it's next is the... Um, the the black male, then the the wait, white, wait. white female is next, and then the black female is the strongest when it comes to being premature, having you know strong lungs. What'd you call <laughs> what'd you call a white the white we male? Call a white male, a, a wimpy white male, <laughs> because they're the ones that end up on the ventilators. You know, I'm glad you still use that word because that's like they they still talk they still do that in hospitals. Yep. <laughs> wimpy white boy. The wimpy white boy. <laughs> And then, um, like in sociology, I teach this thing about um, I, t I teach about suicide, and 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 some of the major work from suicide is done by this guy named Emil Durkheim, and um, he says something kind of similar that that white males tend to commit suicide the most, and then black males and white women, and then black women are the least likely to commit suicide. You know, so it's like, what is it about? like white males that there's like this failure to thrive, you know, like higher cases of it. So um, Durkheim was saying that it's because like white men are, have, have, have fewer um, significant bonds in their life. So that, that was what he was saying, but that's different. I, I thought it was interesting. Like when you said that word, like I caught it, like I knew, I knew exactly what you were saying. Okay. Um, and they ha have you ever heard Tobosh? Uh -uh. Take them out, back and shoot them. Um, back and shoot. <laughs> maybe that's more extreme. I can't think of all these things anymore. But there's like codes. Um, all right. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's that's the issue with being born premature. You know, most of the organs 
Um, and I, I'm, I'm telling like everyone else, right? Most of the organs are like, okay, it's enough. It's the lungs that are like the last to fully develop. And the real issue with the lungs not developing is the, the septal cells. So that's, that's why they need help. They need help to get, it's, they're breathing. They just need to get that oxygen past that layer and into the blood. So that's, that's the main issue with being born premature. Um, Okay. Thanks for adding that. All right. So, um, any other questions on on anatomy? Oh God, six forty three. Um. All right. Let me start talking about physiology. So we got you see three laws. Some of you are already writing them down. I imagine that would be a good idea. Um, for those of you that are not writing stuff down. You should strongly consider doing it, even though I wrote it down. But um, if you had me for lecture, I won't. I would not write down anything for you. Like, there's no powerpoints where I write stuff down. I just give you pictures because in writing stuff down, it helps you learn it. So that's what makes it really difficult right now. I really feel like you should. Most of you should write this stuff down. That's how it really helps you learn it. But anyway. Um, Three laws that are that I'm going to talk about um, here and there. So Boyle's law is the first one, an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. That's what this is showing you. We've actually discussed Boyle's law when we talked about blood pressure. Vasoconstriction raises blood pressure. Vasodilation, not dilation. Vasodilation. Um, lowers lowers blood pressure i had to like do it with my hands and think about it right so um you know squeeze a water bottle like a closed water bottle you squeeze it with your hands what's happening to the pressure inside it's going up there's more pressure inside you're squeezing it but the volume because you're squeezing it the volume inside that bottle is becoming less right so that works with blood pressure that is also going to work with lungs so we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then we're going to talk about Dalton's law. Each, oh, I see a mistake I made. Each gas exerts its own pressure. So there's different gases in the ambient. We call this ambient air, you know, the air around us. Most of it is actually nitrogen. About 70, I don't have the exact number, 78% is nitrogen. And then how much is oxygen? I don't know, 20.9. People always correct me, but it's around 21%. And then the rest of it is um, carbon dioxide and water vapor and some other carcinogens if you're living in Shell Net. So the point of Dalton's law is each gas exerts its own pressure. So the pressure of oxygen does not depend on what the pressure of uh, carbon dioxide is or what the pressure of uh, nitrogen is. It's, it's independent. Just like Patrick Swayze's character in Roadhouse, Roadhouse 1, not Roadhouse 2. Patrick Swayze wasn't in Roadhouse 2. Roadhouse 1, that was his name was Dalton, and he was his own independent guy. So you'll remember that one now. And then Henry's Law, which is kind of the most difficult one, and that's talking about the amount of gas. And what gas are we talking about here? Oxygen. The amount of gas which does, will dissolve in a liquid. Liquid, we mean blood. So the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in blood, meaning go into your blood and be there to get transported, depends on the partial pressure of the gas, meaning the pressure of the oxygen. So the, so higher pressure of oxygen, more of it goes into your blood. That's what we're saying. And then the solubility of the liquid. So the blood has to be set up to take that oxygen. And there's different factors that affect the solubility of the blood, which we're going to talk about. Um, just to give you a quick example, um, heat. When your body gets hotter, your blood's not as likely to hold on to oxygen. It's more likely to let it go. All right, so three laws I'd, that I would like you to know, Boyle's Law, Dalton's Law, Henry's Law. 
And the first one, Boyle's Law, is going to pertain to this next slide that we're going to talk about. Which is breathing in, inhalation, inspiration, inhalation, whatever you want to call it. It's an active process, meaning that active versus passive, whether you need energy or not. You need to you need to use ATP to breathe in. You don't need to breathe anything to breathe out. It's automatic. If somebody is trying to breathe out and they're not like running a marathon or not working out or something, if somebody's just sitting in a chair trying to breathe out, that's a key sign that uh, something's wrong. Breathing out. So when you breathe in, your lungs are kind of like elastic, right? So that elastic is going to kind of bounce back, elastic recoil. That's what we call it, right? So that's so breathing out should just happen. That's part of the problem with surfactant, that your lungs are kind of elastic. And then, um, you know, so when, when, you're, um, when you're getting um, – like when, when the surface tension, like when the water's too much and you can't get the oxygen past, it like pulls on that elastic. So you're like pulling on the elastic strap. So then when you breathe out, it would happen actually faster, right? But sometimes the elasticity, when you have some lung diseases, sometimes that elasticity of your lungs can, you know, it's like old underwear where the elastic just doesn't work anymore, right? And so you know, or like an old rubber band and just stretches out really easy, but it doesn't go back. And so now you have to kind of like push it on it. And you have to make it breathe out. So you'll see them, um, like they'll have like their lips, they call it pursed lips. You'll see their lips, they'll like that. That's like a definite sign. Um, yeah. They're sitting, they call it like a tripod, but like they're sitting up, right? They are not like laying back. Like they're sitting up and like, Sometimes they'll have like their hands out in front of them, like an arched back. Um, so anyway, but anyway, it's breathing in's active. So what is it that's like getting um, contracted? Um, mostly it's your diaphragm. So diaphragmic breathing or deep breathing, um, that's about 75% of what makes you breathe. So we'll sometimes call that deep breathing or diaphragmic breathing. Eupnea is just normal breathing. The PNEA tells you it has something to do with breathing. Like that word is in pneumonia, right? Um, uh, eupnea, EU means like normal. So normal breathing, right? So normally breathing, about 75% of it is because of your diaphragm. 25% roughly is because of your intercostals which are the muscles in between your ribs and you've got actually three sets of muscles in between each rib so you have like um external intercostals internal intercost intercostals and one other type of intercostal that i really don't feel like trying to recall in my head because it doesn't matter for so much for breathing but um the external intercostals external for breathing in the internal intercostals can be used to breathe out. So anyway, the intercostals. So let's talk about these two different factors, diaphragm and intercostals. And we're going to do intercostals first. This is a really good analogy, the bucket handle on a bucket. So when that bucket handle is lift, lifted up, there is much more space in here now. But when that bucket handle is just sitting here against the bucket, there's no space on the inside. So it's like that. You're lifting your rib cage up. It's like a bucket handle. So now you've created more space in your thorax. I don't know why I'm touching down here. You're creating more space in your thorax when you lift your rib cage up. Um, so that's good because you want your lungs to get bigger. And when your lungs get bigger, think of Boyle, Boyle's Law now. When your lungs get bigger, what happens to the pressure in your lungs? You could just like think of it to yourself. When your lungs get bigger, pressure goes down, which is what you want. I want to get the pressure in my lungs lower than the pressure in this air around us because I want that air to go into my lungs. So this is one. So here is your 
um, what are they saying internal there? Here's your external intercostals that are lifting your rib cage, like that bucket handle. And here is how your diaphragm is when it's relaxed. This is not contracted. It's relaxed like this, and when it's contracted, it flattens down. So when it flattens down, that makes more space for the lungs to get larger. So I don't care about you memorizing these numbers. I'm just, we're gonna use these numbers just to demonstrate, right? And, and again, MMHG stands for millimeters of mercury. Just like we measure blood pressure like this, we measure the pressure of gases. So the pressure of the air in general, everything, the pressure of the air outside is 760. For us at sea level here, it's about 760. Okay, so um, I'm doing this myself. So the pressure in the lungs is also around 760. But now we're going to breathe in. So first thing that happens before the air goes in you is that your diaphragm goes down. And now look at the pressure. It drops to 758. So now when the diaphragm goes flat, when it contracts, my lungs get bigger and the pressure goes down to 758. Outside, 760. In my lungs, 758. So the air that's outside, it goes into my lungs. We're not sucking air in. Unless you're really thinking about it. You're like, okay, I'm going to breathe in now. Yeah, okay. You sucked air in. But normally when you're just breathing, it goes into your lungs. You're not pulling it in. It wants to go in because the, it goes air pressure goes from higher to lower, right? It's diffusion. So, and then when you breathe out, it's it's really elastic recoil. When you breathe out, it, you you um, you know the elastic makes the lungs get smaller. That makes the pressure go go up. And so, if you look at this third one here, they're saying when you're when you're breathing out. It goes up to 762, outside 760, so the air goes out. The point I'm making is that, not that the numbers, the numbers aren't important. Um, higher to lower. We're, we're talking about higher pressure to lower pressure. That's how everything moves around. That's how all the gases move around your body. They go from a higher pressure to a lower pressure. And that's what's making you breathe in. So your lungs are getting larger. And also, as I was saying, like, it's not really like this. Like, you see how there's like a, the diaphragm's flat in this photo on the right, but there's like a space between the lungs and the diaphragm. That's not how it is. They're, they're, they're kind of like connected. When that diaphragm goes down, it, it creates a suction and it, it pulls the, the lungs down. And then your rib cages or your external intercostals are, Again, I'm pointing down to my abdomen, or lifting your rib cage. So, I think this slide explains it. Don't get hung up on numbers. Get hung up on the idea. It's Boyle's Law. Diaphragm contracts, flattens. Lung volume gets larger. Pressure inside lungs goes down. Probably be the last slide I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is the last slide I'm going to talk about. Um, so, any questions about breathing in, inspiration and expiration, or inhalation and exhalation? A lot of information, Professor. A lot. It is, huh? You want to stop here? No, sir. I'll do this very last one. I mean, it's kind of the same, and I can revisit it. It's just, this one's just capacities. Um, and then that's it. Um, so breathing in, just normal breathing in that you've been doing for the last hour is just called tidal volume, like the tide coming in. That's it, it's tide. Tide goes in and out. 
How much? 500 milliliters. So that's right here. Sometimes they will put like a big V, and I'll write this when we meet again, I'll write it on the PowerPoint. It's like a V with a little T. So that stands for tidal volume, and that's just a normal breath, regular breath. Every time you just breathe in normally, eupnea, that's um, 500 milliliters. And just to remind you, 500 milliliters is about the volume of a water bottle. But you could breathe in more, right? So if I tell you, okay, breathe in. Now, breathe in as much as you possibly can after your regular breath in. So just breathe in normal. Now, take in everything you can. So my question is, how much more air can you get into your lungs besides that normal breath that you take? And that's called inspiratory reserve volume. So the answer to that is about three, a little more than three liters, or 3,100 milliliters, right? 1,000 milliliters equals one liter. So anyway, how much can I breathe in? 500 mils? Okay, but what if I keep going? Like how much can I get into my lungs all together? Well, all together, like what's my capacity to breathe in, inspiratory capacity, what can I breathe in, and in total, 3.6 liters or 3,600 milliliters. That's like the total volume I could take in. So think of it like a two liter bottle, right? A two liter bottle is 2,000 milliliters. So I could take in a two liter bottle, I could fit 80% of another two liter bottle. That's about how much air I can get into my lungs. Well, how about going the other way? How much can I breathe out? So I'll say like, you know, breathe out. Okay, now I'll breathe everything out that you can. Just push, 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 push. I can get out another 1.2 liters. So you breathe out. Now breathe everything you possibly can out. And that's called expiratory reserve volume. You notice here that we're not going all the way down to the bottom. That means you, you can't breathe out all your air. You, 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 you can't, you're not able. So breathe out. Now just breathe out normally. Now breathe out everything you possibly can. You could breathe out another 1,200 milliliters. But you're gonna have Look, even after you breathe out everything you possibly can, you're still gonna have a little bit of air in your lungs, another 1,200 milliliters. So, um, so the total, well, the total's not so important. So these are just, you know, tidal volume is a number that's always used. Um, inspiratory reserves used. I mean, I really don't know. It's, it depends on people that specialize in pulmonology. I, I've seen expiratory reserve. That's like a very common one. Um, so, does anybody have any questions or anything to add? All right, let me go back. Okay. Um, so, I will finish. For sure by on Wednesday I'm gonna finish this lecture up and I might I might start on um, digestive I don't know but um, this this one's done for today so we have the three laws um, what makes us breathe in what makes us breathe out and then some of those capacities what's what's tidal volume what's inspiratory reserve what's expiratory reserve the, the names tell you what they are all right, let me um, stop my recording.